Um, so this is a Fisher, and um, I'll be talking, obviously, about them a little bit. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge just the many people who contribute money and um, resources and the site that we do all of our stuff on. Um, obviously, they wouldn't um, have a project if it wasn't for all those different people. So not by name, but if you know any of those guys, give them the appropriate credit when you see them. Um, so probably most of you uh, understand that competition is an important aspect of um, animals and the way they go about making decisions um, relative to their fitness. And so this occurs within species. Um, in between species um, to get very re various resources, um, food probably being the most prominent and the most um, common that we talk about. Um, this is an interesting photo of a fisher carrying something, we don't know what, up to its den and a red tail hawk over here um, swooping down. And I don't know what the intention of the red tail hawk is, but I uh, assume it's not to stop by and say hi. So um, competition is occurring all over the place in, in different forms. Um, and specifically with regards to conspecific competition, um, there's been a lot of different papers and, and concepts about this. Um, Charnoff in the 70s and, and his co-authors talked about the, the different implications of this. Um, Jets et al. in 2004 talked about this with regards to home range establishment and home range size. And so the, the basic concept is if there's conspecifics who are taking your resources or depressing the resources, it behooves you potentially not to use the same home ranges, which is of why animals establish home ranges. So we don't necessarily have um, great empirical data on this all the time, especially for things like fishers and other carnivores that have big home ranges, and it's hard to document these things. So one of the places that you might do this is a translocation, which is what Roger and I were involved with. And um, fishers, if you don't know, um, occur, man, my hand is shaking, throughout um, North America. In the boreal forest, they're associated with places with big trees, um, dense trees, and a little bit of hardwood um, component to try to get um, places to den. Um, we are specifically talking about California, so we were translocating fishers from this population into the northern Sierras, sort of in between the two extent populations in California. And um, fishers, um, we don't think, have a whole lot of face-to-face -face communication with one another. Most of it is going on through scent, and fishers have these really cool little scent glands. This isn't the best picture in the world, but these little scent glands on their paws that every time they're stepping around, we think they're dispersing little molecules of scent for other fishers to smell and understand different bits of information potentially about their age, the last time they were there. And so this is giving information about um, resource suppression um, and different aspects of, of their ecology. The first time we ever captured a fisher, I was very excited, I told Roger, we captured a fisher, Roger, and he said, don't they smell wonderful? And I said, no, I'm not sure they smell wonderful, but they certainly have a unique smell. Um, but they are smelly critters to humans and um, certainly very smelly to one another. So a few hypotheses that we thought when we started translocating animals, pretty straightforward, is that the fishers that were first introduced would pretty much stay in the areas that we put them, um, provided that there was adequate habitat, which is a part of uh, the goals of the translocation was to assess that. And that fishers who were released later on would move further, move faster, and try to avoid those places where home ranges were already established to avoid the inevitable competition that was going from there. And ultimately what we'd like to do is to use the metrics of places where animals avoid and places that they move fast to identify home ranges or places that other animals um, are using those areas um, potentially if you've lost an animal from tracking with telemetry or different things like that. So that's ultimately the goal. Um, not going to get there completely today, but we will touch upon that a little bit. So as I said, we're working in Northern California. These are just some of the places we trap. So we trap from a diversity of places for genetic reasons, but also to try to mitigate the impact that we would have on any one location. Um, this is a long range project um, that we've been doing to monitor those populations, or at least that population, to make sure that we're not um, affecting them too much, and so far we haven't been. And all of the animals are coming to this location here. It's owned by Sierra Pacific Industries, who's a logging um, company, and so they're interested in conservation of fishers on their lands. And we have moved 40 fishers over the course of three years, um, 24 females and 16 males. And you can kind of see the distribution um, in the beginning. We put um, Fisher's pretty much right in the middle of, of the landscape. And as we sort of went to year two and year three, 
we expanded out outwards. Um, very often, fishers were in contact with other fishers or on the home ranges, uh, edges of ho uh, the home ranges of other fishers. And in some cases, we thought, well, we'll put some out there where they really don't think there are any and see what their responses are, and to get some distribution across the entire landscape. So pretty standard uh, methods for what we were doing here. We put um, either implants in the first year um, or collars in the second and third years. And then you can see Roger out here with the ubiquitous Yagi trying to do triangulations. And this is what the majority of our location for females um, came from. We did do some aerial telemetry. And then we have things like trapping data or um, some camera data and things like that. But the majority of locations come from um, that. And we try to do a location a day for Fisher, but you know, circumstances always are in your favor. And so, you know, for instance, one year we spent the majority of March and April cutting trees to try to get um, to where we were going. So I got really good with the chainsaw, but less good with the VHF, uh, VHF telemetry that month. Um, so for males who are a bit bigger, we um, outfitted them with Argos collars, the Sirtrack Kiwi Sat 202 or 203. And so we were getting hopefully daily locations on those, some of them better, some of them worse. And we tried to stagger them throughout um, time blocks that would give us representative data um, throughout different um, times of day. So part of um, releasing animals and trying to assess their movements is knowing something about their habitat. If you have really poor habitat, and it's not reasonable to think that a fisher would stay there. So this is one of many fisher models. This is based on the California Hab Wildlife Habitat Relations model. And so the darker the green, the higher predicted the value of, of habitat. And the main point of that is just to suggest that there seems to be reasonable habitat um, throughout the entire district, and at least in the places that we were releasing fishers. And so we don't think, at least right now, that that was a major factor, but that's something we want to look into later and then to sort of use what we're learning um, about their relationships to other, each other to understand the habitat a bit better. So a little bit about some of the results we saw. So this is just um, a series of dots based on the year that we released female fishers. Um, I'll talk mostly about female fishers just because I'm still um, messing with the Argos data and all the filtering that needs to be done to get um, really accurate estimates. But if you look at either of these metrics, one is just the mean distance from um, the release point that a female established her home range, or the distance, um, the maximum distance that we saw her move. There's a difference between females in year one compared to years two and three, and males are sort of just all over the place. And that might be because when we first let them go, there wasn't any female sense out there, and they said, this place really sucks. I'm going someplace where there's girls. And then in later years, there's girls around. So um, you can see this pattern. Um, First year blue, more or less where we stayed. There was some, some wide-ranging dispersal, but a lot of them came back and settled in the places that we um, settled them. And then in years two, you're seeing an expansion. And in years three, in places where we didn't think there was home ranges, they're sort of staying around there. And an interesting part of this is there are some of these animals um, in the latter years that are being pushed into places that didn't really look like good habitat. And so maybe some of those places that are sort of really good habitat are sort of being taken up and um, females are having to choose lower quality places, but we haven't um, really assessed that yet, but it's certainly possible. So if you look at these data compared to, um, and base it on fishers that we released within a known home range compared to fishers outside of a known home range, what you see is a pattern of the fishers that were released within a home range, they take off, they go further, they, they establish home, range for, home ranges further away, and that's true of either of the metrics, um, establishment, distance, or the mean distance that they traveled. And so for the majority of the females, we can estimate a home range, but some of them, like this poor female, died within a few days um, after release. But the majority did establish home ranges, so we have reasonable data for a carnivore study. <laughs> so if you divide up the, the district into a series of grid cells and just count the number of locations for a female or females in those locations and compare, what you see is that you know, they have segregated themselves pretty well. In the previous slides, this was yellow, but the yellow wasn't showing up very well, so it's green now. But, um, and if you compare either year one to year two or year three to year two or any of those correlations, what you see is that any place that um, one cohort of females was, the other cohort tended to avoid pretty seriously. So they don't, they don't like to be around each other. If there's a place that's already been established as a home range, another female 
isn't going to stay there. And that makes a lot of sense based on what we understand about fishers and you know, ecology in general. If you look at this with regards to the speed, uh, how fast they moved away from the release site, there's also an apparent effect um, based on um, whether they were released within a home range or outside of a home range. And so on day one, you can see the females that were released um, in places where we don't think there were other fishers, they stayed pretty close and didn't move very far. And other females were moving much faster. And this is an average uh, across all the females by those days. And so you can see by day 20 or 25, they've sort of settled into home ranges or becoming very close. And there's some interesting things where you'll see a female who settled down for two or three months and then for whatever reason decides to move and then she establishes a completely new area 15 kilometers away or something. So there's a lot of really cool and interesting patterns there that we're still trying to assess in terms of developing hypotheses or analyses that figure out what's going on for those. And a lot of those are probably habitat based. <clears throat> so as we think about those patterns and what we were seeing on the landscape, so for example here, there's an empty patch with very few locations. And we knew that there was a female that in 2010 had used this area. We lost her from um, telemetry tracking. The, the transmitter died uh, prematurely. But no other animal ever really settled in there. And so we always hypothesized that this was an area that she had maintained a home range. Other animals were respecting that. And then it says 2014, but in the fall of 2013, we trapped that female again. And so she had been hiding there for three years, unwilling to go into the traps, but she had been there and other animals had sort of respected that area. And so we think that those sort of metrics um, allow us to make some pretty interesting hypotheses about where animals are that we can't detect, whether they be animals that we've lost from telemetry or the juveniles. So a couple, a couple other places, um, for instance here, another premature failure. Um, we've got uh, females on camera there. So we think that is still an occupied home range. I added the green dots here. These are juveniles that have moved in and some of those are overlapping what we think is their mother's home ranges. But some of them are in areas that have never really been settled and we think there's just juveniles in those areas that we've never trapped. Um, and some places we just don't know. Maybe it is a question of habitat. Maybe it's a question of um, there being other animals that we can't detect there yet. <clears throat> so a lot of interesting questions that are emerging and we're trying to sort of get to the bottom of those and separate the effect of when an animal has, you really threw me with that, but um, trying to separate the effects of when habitat is perhaps the cause of why an animal doesn't settle in an area versus there's another animal that's living there. And so kind of the final point that I'd like to make about all of this is that as we start to develop you know, much finer scale technologies with GPS activity sensors that hopefully inform us about the behaviors that animals are doing, you know, whether it be foraging or resting for fishers um, or uh, other behaviors for other organisms, I think it's important to consider the effect um, that the conspecifics that those animals are having or that are out there are having on the animals. And so in places where you do have high travel rates, um, are those travel rates associated with the way that the animal perceives the landscape with regards to the habitat? Or is the habitat perhaps um, okay but being moderated by some other animal that's depressing the resources? And so I think it's important to realize that some of these behaviors are not just what they seem on the surface, that there are multiple parameters that are perhaps um, constituting those things. And it's important to consider those not only for things like translocating animals and figuring out the optimal way to put them out on the landscape, but for habitat associations um, and other important aspects of ecology and, and determining fitness and behavior. So this is a fisher who was re recently floated on Cape Cod, which is not what we think of as fisher habitat, and it's probably moving fairly quickly. but sort of an interesting um, side note of that. So I'm done. We have time for some questions. Yes. We're, we're working on that actually. We're, we've just in the past few years started to develop some protocols to try to sample small mammals, which we think is what um, fishers are primarily eating. We also have a lot of remote cameras out there through the course of the year. And so we're getting occupancy estimates on what prey are there. And to a degree, we think that maybe 
the presence of a certain prey type is just as important as the abundance. You know, if you have squirrels versus paramiscus, that that's um, where fishers are going to forage. But those are things that we're, we're working on. So we do have some very rudimentary measures that we're trying to refine. But, you know, right now I couldn't say that we have a, a really good measurement of those things. And, and they're, frankly, very hard. So, yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, we haven't assessed the habitat um, independently at this point, but that's one of the major things that we're trying to assess. And what we're kind of doing right now is we're just getting over that establishment phase where you know, a lot of things can happen in those early years that maybe cause the, the, the translocation to fail, or maybe they go well despite the fact that, that the habitat isn't as good as we hypothesize that it might be. So really right now, we, we think that the habitat was reasonable to establish the, the population, but long-term persistence is something we're still addressing. But I, I think just in my own experience, a lot of those things are holding true, but I think there's a lot of context to them, and so maybe in certain seasons they're using um, really big old stuff like maybe in the summer when it's hot and in the winter or when they're denning and there's kits within the tree they're using maybe a slightly warmer site so I, I think they are coming through but maybe a little more contextual than you usually associate them with <laughs>